Hello, this is Lisa Bowerman, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who. In the audio medium, I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip, we've got an amazing show lined up today. Yeah, it's going to be pretty good, I think. Yeah, we're going to be speaking with the incredible Susanna Harker, who we're both long-time fans of, even in stuff that she was in before uh, doing Doctor Who for Big Finish, and of course... Sapphire and Steel. She played the part of Sapphire back when Big Finish had the license uh, in the sort of mid 2000s. So we're going to be chatting with her later on. But before we do, Philip, yes, do you what know do we, what we need to do? What do we need to do, Dwayne? Well, we don't need to, but we have to because it's right there and we're falling in. It's a rabbit hole. Me, me. <laughs> So we're in the rabbit hole, Philip, and this topic is going to be all about one of Susanna Harker's big finish appearances, and that is Sharda. And it got me thinking about Sharda uh, because she has a, quite a major role in that production. And I'm not going to talk about Susanna's part in that so much as much as the story, because it is one of the most remade stories. <laughs> Uh, ever produced in uh, the Doctor Who universe after being lost for so long and so legendary. What I want to know what your definitive version of the story Sharda is. Can you tell me? It's quite hilarious. I don't think any story has been made more often in more forms than Sharda. Um, so, yes, you lose two recording sessions and suddenly now it's become this amazing um Hit. Um, oh, well, the definitive form, I suspect it actually probably is the still the V for me, the video, video, V, okay, we remember what the, what were the tapes called? VHS? VHS. 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 There you go. Um, that's how it was. I think the first VHS that came out was probably for me a very crucial one because that was the first time I got to see everything that'd been made. And yeah, I loved it. It made sense. I thought that was great. But I mean, the most recent one I think has been the book being published about two or three years ago, and I, and I can't remember whether it's Gareth Roberts or who wrote the book. Uh, it was or it James, was Goss. James Goss. Might be James I Goss. I think it might have been James Goss actually. Um, and, and that is hilarious. So, like the book is spectacular. Um, so yes, yeah, so when the book came out, I wasn't sure about it, but the, the book is amazing. I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's James Goss now you say that. Just that he's captured the Douglas, um, Adam's humor. But for me, it's probably the VHS, though when this version came out, um, with Paul McGann, it was astounding that Big Finish were redoing it and, and the little tricks that they played in it in terms of getting around how the story worked and what a cast. I'm not sure Big Finish has ever had such a, monumental cast as we're in this so you yeah. had for the harry potter fans sean bigger stuff in one of his first works um of yep. course susanna harker who we're going to be talking to um you had andrew Sachs, of course who played manuel in faulty towers who's a fa favorite of mine melvin hayes who i knew from a hot, hot mum um hannah gordon we've seen lots of stuff at the big finish too james fox i yes. mean it, it, is Huge just, name. it is the most <laughs> ridiculous cast they managed to pull together for this production and it is stunning but what about you Dwayne? What's, what's, what's your definitive charter well i managed to to see bootleg copies of all that footage before it was officially released on vhs and without it being touched up it did not do anything for me in the slightest it had no music uh, and it wasn't put together in any kind of cohesive fashion um so it it was 
kind of strange to watch that for the first time. Where, I, I where wish... did you see that? Because I've, I've never seen that. Just, just uh, with it, it was just floating around. It was like all the all the bootleg copies of yeah, okay. uh, black and whites. It was at that time period, and yep. it was just floating around then. So it was like you know second, third, fourth generation or whatever it was. So mm. it wasn't perfect quality either. But yeah, then the VHS came out. Tom Baker's linking narration between the bits in that was pretty cool. Uh, so it was nice to get that. Although the music, the music was done by Kef McCulloch, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure it was, yes. For that, because it was produced by John Nathan Turner, that one. So yep. I'm pretty sure Kef did that. Um, but yeah, the definitive version for me, and I, I will say the most recent release version of it would be the Blu-ray version, because that is slightly different to the previous Blu-ray and DVD version in that it has been cut into its proper six episode uh, installments, whereas the um, the, pr the the first uh, DVD release of the animation uh, of the existing material and animation did not it, it was a it was a full length, so it was two and a half hours. So I think that's the most recent, and for for many, I think that would be the definitive version of the Blu-ray. But for me, it always will be big finish. Don't forget they had the anima. Well, it wasn't really animation. It was like still <laughs> photograph animation, slight animation. It was um, agony to watch. Can I just say, with your download waiting for it to come through the the, the telephone line. <laughs> this is this is before um, cable. It was all on. I mean, I watched it first time on phone lines. Yeah. Just waiting for the pictures to, 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 to come in. It was agony. But well, speaking of James Goss, he was behind that production as well. So he he was the producer for that. And it's very interesting. I just moved to Tasmania at the time, and there were copies of it floating around to be sh like to be shown at certain day events and things like that. And we actually got permission to show it at an event uh, down here in Tasmania from James. So how so, did how did you view it through the internet or no no we got it on a we had a DVD copy okay um, it was it was an unofficial uh, DVD copy uh, but yeah we just showed that in in one of the libraries in Hobart with uh, an audience of about forty or fifty people sat through the whole thing and everyone was riveted by yeah. it and I love the way that they managed to adjust the script so that it logically placed don't ask me to explain it to you right now how it was done but it was able to logically place the eighth doctor in tom baker's position with uh, lala ward as romana but she was also the president so she was in that position as well and it was done seamlessly i thought it worked so well so yeah for me that is my definitive version of Sharda. absolutely it's the first one i'll always go back to if i want to get a taste of Sharda again hmm. that sounds great Let's get out of the rabbit hole. Let's throw in a trailer for Sharda, actually, the big Finnish version of Sharda. And we'll be back in a moment with Susanna Harker. Beware the sphere. Beware Skagra. Beware Sharda. Come on, Ramana, come on, K9. We've got to go back. Back to Cambridge, 1979. Ah, Doctor, how splendid to see you. You too, Professor. This is Romana. Ship, welcome home, my lord. My ship, tell me of the one called The Doctor. You brought a book from Gallifrey to Cambridge. Yes, just a few knickknacks, you know, and you know how I love my books, Doctor. It's the book itself. It's atomically unstable. It seems to be absorbing radioactivity. A book's doing that? Yes, I think it's very, very dangerous. We must find the professor. Do you know him? Hardly at all. He just lent me a book. A book? We've been looking for a book. It is a very dangerous book. And I have been very careless with it. It is the key to Sharda. It would help if we knew who Sharda was. Who or what? How naive, Doctor. How pathetically limited your vision. Limited? A take over the universe. Oh, how childish. Welcome back to your ship, my lord. What is that? Estimated arrival of life form in this command area in 21 seconds and counting. What? K9, why on earth didn't you try and tell me sooner? Doctor, look out! For a dead man, Doctor, you are extremely ingenious. Genius, genius, genius. 
From the earliest of days, Big Finish has been aimed to attract some great actors and also big names in the acting industry. Today we speak with someone who became a drop-dead famous in the BBC fil film House of Cards and has continued to a st stellar career in film, television, stage and audio. So welcome, Susanna Harker. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Now, I believe you have a bit of turmoil happening over there in terms of your water supply. That's right, yes. <laughs> well, yes, we have no water currently in South East London or in my part of South East London. So we're all awaiting. So there might be a knock at the door any minute, in which case I may have to respond because I've got a very thirsty dog here. <laughs> a jackapoo. So um, I've been giving him sparkling water, which isn't really to his taste, but it's... Uh, so, so I, I may have to cut it short at some point or I may have to disappear then come back. That's all. No, that's fine. That happens. <laughs> Not a problem. They're um, thirsty. How, 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 hot, how hot is it there at the moment? Very hot. I don't know. It's been really hot, isn't it? It's not the 40 degrees that it was a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. It isn't in that in that zone, but it's really warm. It's actually rather lovely at the moment. So I'm not complaining, but that it's, it's, it's kind of like being in Australia. When I've been in Australia, it feels like that very, very much. Yeah, no, you, I, I believe you've actually been to Australia a few times, I know. I, I know you filmed, one of the first things you did was a, a, a show called Burke and Wills. Um, is, that, yes. is, that the, is that the first time you were in Australia or were here before that? I, I wasn't in Australia for that. Oh. I was in, no, uh, because I was about 18. I was still at drama school and um, they took me to Hever Castle in Kent. So I did the English bit. Um, and uh, I was still at drama school, I know that. So I had to run around a maze in Hever Castle in Kent. So, no, I never made it to Australia. Oh, that um, time, okay. Sadly, but I, I have been several times. Uh, and a godfather, I have a godfather, um, an actor called um, Neil Fitzpatrick, who's now dead. But Neil is quite an established Australian actor, did, and he lived out in Sydney. So when I'd been to Sydney, I used to see him. He's done loads of films and stuff. Mm. He was lovely, Neil, so yeah. Okay. I, 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 I thought you were playing one of the explorer's daughters, but you were in Hever Castle. Um, That's a long I time ago, I know, it. wasn't it? Come on, I was 18. <laughs> <laughs> Who was I playing? I have no idea. All I know is that I had a Victorian hairdo and that I had to run around a maze in Hever Castle and sit there eating sandwiches. And uh, and uh, so that's about my only memory. Nigel Havers, maybe Nigel Havers. I think I played his younger sister. I think it was Flashback. I'm um, pretty sure that's what it was. It was Flashback and I played a sister. I played Nigel Havers' character who played either Burke or Wills. Um, and I played I played his sister, pretty sure, running around Heaver Castle in the grounds. But that's all I remember of it. I'm afraid. Sorry yeah. about that. No, that's okay. I, mean, I must admit, I love Heaver Castle. Last, um, I took all my kids there <laughs> a few years back, and they had yeah. such a ball going through the different mazes. Of course, I assume you weren't playing either the water maze or the wooden one. It was the uh, traditional old one. You would have been acting in, no doubt, with the hedges. It would have been the traditional old one. And I remember it was extraordinary. I cannot remember anything. I need my CV in front of me. I can't even remember who the director was. Um, and he was an American. No, uh, anyway. But uh, I do remember that I was taken out of drama school and my, and my humble lodgings in wherever it was um, at the time was up near the Arsenal because um, I, was, I was at Central. And, and I remember suddenly being transported into these amazing grounds and into this. And actually, my bedroom was just along a corridor from the actual castle itself. And I could wander, and I did indeed, age 18, wander the, the halls and the castle, you know, while everyone was asleep and in bed and went into the museum. It was an extraordinary. And I remember opening the curtains in the morning and there were cows and pastures, and it was a very, very heady start to, to my to acting. You know, it was downhill from there. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> it was no, Graham, it wasn't. Graham Clifford, by the way. Graham Clifford. That's exactly who it was. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So there were about four of us staying there, um, in these in these on this extraordinary location in these amazing grounds. You know, um, and and it was there for our perusal. You know, we could go where we wanted. I remember walking along and seeing all the kind of, you know, the waxworks of, of people in costumes being spelled in the middle of the night. Very creepy. I've forgotten that. 
So yeah, that was how I started. That was the kickoff, I think. Yes. Wow. So let's go back a little bit earlier. So what, what was it that originally made you want to become an actor? Well, I come from actors, you know, generations, generations of actors going back to, to jugglers in the street to medieval times, apparently. Whoa, okay. And uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> we, we really do have roots, roots in it. So, and the Harker line, um, Joseph Harker was, was Henry Irving's scenic painter, Victorian um, scenic painter, which in those days was like being a filmmaker or, or, or you know, because there was no TV. So uh, he was quite well known. He was quite famous for his time. He's written books and, um, and th th there were about six of them. And one of his brothers was Gordon Harker, who uh, um, uh, was, had done lots of kind of, uh, had worked in, in Ealing comedies at the time, the very, very early days of Ealing comedy. And um, he was a character actor. He um, started the Blue Lamp in the Blue Lamp, um, Dixon, which was the original of Dixon of Doc Green. He said he was a sort of Cockney London character actor and he was the brother, no, the son of Joseph Harker, who was Henry Irving's scenic painter. And then we were descended from Dora, who was an actress, who was his sister. So some of them were actress, were actors, and some of them were scenic painters. And that's how it went for generations. Um, and so Joseph Harker was, was um, brought up on the back of a truck touring the country with uh, a mother who took, an, took him on the stage in arms, you know, in her arms. There's a wonderful book by him called Studio and Stage, which maps out the whole of those early, you know, in the in the 19th century, early 19th century, that would have been, I guess. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of history there, which we've been looking into because of the Harker Studios, which is not far from where I am in South London, um, which unfortunately has closed down. There was a bid to save it. And he opened that um, at the turn of the century, 1905, I think it was. And, um, and it's got amazing, um, you know, paint frame, huge paint frames there um, and has been used, has been the only practical London, um, uh, you know, stage studio really, because um, they've all moved out of town. So we were trying to save it, but it didn't, it didn't happen. But there were a lot of actors pulled together and it's been sold, unfortunately. But they are preserving the stage frames, these huge stage frames, and some of the names of the actors at the time that are in, in, a, in, a, in a booth, which are written on the wall. So, um, you know, it's a historic place. So, so, yeah, we have a sense, I have a sense, and my family do have a sense of a theatrical history and of being connected to, to the business and to acting. We do, we do have that, yeah our heritage. So, so I guess it started early, but um, I, my earliest memory was, you know, playing the Virgin Mary in a school play and, and doing it for real and thinking, you know, this really is a baby and uh, sort of inhabiting it and, um, and getting a sense of it. Then I must have been about seven, which is horribly precocious, but, but yeah, that's when, it, that's when it was sort of born, the desire was, was in me. And so, so the next generation, um, uh, there aren't any actors, but my son is, is a theatre director, is, and so he's in the theatre. And I've got a niece who's also a scene designer or a theatre designer who's doing really well. You know, she's picked up a couple of awards already. She's very young. And there are a couple of little ones that belong to my half-sister, and they, one of them might well go into acting. But the chain hasn't been broken, is my point, for a long, long time. Long time. Medi since medieval times, yeah. So there's no one in the family discouraging you from going into acting then? Uh, no, but you know what? You know, there is a realistic approach to it, you know, which is, I think, is, is a good advantage, you know, advantage to have if you come from an acting family. So you see the reality of it, which is not early on, you know. It's, it's not an easy profession. And, and so you go in, I think, with a sense of an awareness of that, you know, that it's not going to be easy, that there are going to be pitfalls, that it, no careers sort of go like that. You know, they always go like that mostly. Yeah. And um, so that served me well to, to come from that background. So I haven't been encouraged. I haven't been told, yeah, you must do it. You know, I've been told, yeah, do it, but do it with your eyes open because, because it's not easy. You've got to really want to do it. And I really do believe actually that it is vocational. Um, 
because it's tough, you know, and, you, and if you're going to, to keep doing it, you know, which is, which is hard for women as well, particularly, you know, you, you, have to, you have to support it with other things, you have to be strategic and you have to diversify a little bit within it, which has been great and I've loved doing that and coming to different, different areas, you know, directing, directed a short film and I'm writing more and developing ideas now which is empowering, you know, to do, but it's, it's, it's not, um, it's not easy. You know, it's everyone will tell you that. Yeah. I believe you went to a fairly strict Catholic school. Did you do much performance while at school? Um, uh, convent boarding school. Yes. <laughs> convent of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Gosh, it's a long, long name, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Who else was there? Amita Deary, who was in This Life, was there with me. You might know her. She was yeah. in this life. She, she was there with me um, in my year, um, but that was the only other actor. There was an actor. Oh gosh, what's her name? It's gone out of my head. This is why I should have had my CV in front of me. Um, though it didn't produce many actors, but um, yes, I went to a strict convent, which I think is quite um, a creative. They don't exist in the same way anymore. But I, I think it does. I, I think. I think. It's stimulating for the imagination, let's put it that way. I actually think it, it's, it creates quite an interesting um, conflict as you're growing up. And I think that that creates um, uh, imagination and, 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 and an understanding of a certain kind of, of drama, I think. Good. Yeah. So was dr drama school a positive experience for you? Yeah, of course. You know, I love drama school central. I really loved it. Um, it was fabulous, yeah. I mean, it's just being the, given the chance to do what you really love for three years, you know, um, and, and trying everything. I mean, but actually, I think I learned more by going probably to be a, an usherette at the National for a couple of years and, and watching shows and actually watching my parents as well in the theatre over and over and over again. I think there's something about seeing things done more than once that, you, that really teaches you. And I think that probably taught me more than anything. Uh, but, but the drama school, of course, it's a brain. I would, I would recommend drama school to everyone. Yeah. I think the thing about the theatre is it's never the same performance ever again. It's, it's a one-off experience that you have with a particular, well, the, I as an audience member has, have with the cast. And, and I know whenever yeah. I've gone back to see a show, you know, a few shows I've gone back to see several times, but it's never the same. And I think that there's a, that, that unique thing the theatre does is produce a different environment, different emotions, different, even though the same words, there's always According to a the audience. Life. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. And you really, you really learn that by seeing things several times. So, so in terms of um, well, what I know you're most famous for, and in terms of, I think, probably a very strong part of your early career um, was playing, playing the role in House of Cards. Um, with yeah. Ian, Ian Richardson, yeah. what was it like in terms of getting getting that role? And it, I mean, I, I, how big was it in England? Because as I said, in Australia, it was huge, and it, it still continues to be huge. It, it, it's available still for free on Australia, on ABC iView. You can oh, still go and watch it because it's it's actually still one of those most popular shows that people still watch. Yeah, there. I think it was one of those that people revisited in lockdown, wasn't it? Because people saw the American version of it, and then I think people had the time to go back and look at the origin of it. And, and I'm very proud to, to have been in that, you know, to have been, to originated. I'm throwing a ball, by the You're way. You're dog good. happy. I know. I'm a nuts dog, so who hasn't got any water, so I've got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exhausted. Yeah, but making thirsty. But, um, uh, yeah, of course, I mean, I was 25. It was, and um, it was an extraordinary, I remember reading it and the hair standing up in the back of my neck, knowing you know, um, that it was the power of it. I knew the power of it as soon as I read it, you know, such a brilliant script. Um, Andrew Davis, you know, um, and I just thought, yeah, I mean, Matty was, was an amazing uh, opportunity, an amazing character. Um, and I, I actually, I, um, I met them and it, it was, I really burnt, really wanted obviously to do it and, and, and had a, had a sense of who she was. But they cast someone else, and I don't think I should probably say who, who it was, but that person did pull out of it for whatever reason. So um, it came back to me. So it had a sense of fate, you know, that I was meant to have done it, I felt. But uh, 
Um, it didn't go my way initially. There was someone much older doing it. So, um, and I think they thought because, because Ian was so much older, he was in his 50s, I think, early 50s, Ian Richardson. Um, I think they'd, they'd initially thought that they'd go with someone older, you know, but, but because that didn't work out, they came to me and um, and so we did have a strange kind of dynamic because I was so I was that much younger, you know, um, and he'd also played my father already in something called Troubles. So it was uh, quite strange to be, you know, therefore suddenly romantically kind of thinking of, of him in a different context in a very different way. Um, but he was incredible, of course, technically incredible and um, and a joy, a joy to work to work with, you know. And um, yeah, I was so blessed to have that experience in my early twenties, yeah. twenty five. You know, I had the privilege of seeing him on stage in Sydney once in a performance, and it was just mind blowing. Was it just... the Miser? Uh, no, it was four. Cra- it was called Four Crowns. So it was him, Dan oh. Rigg, Derek Jacobi, and someone else very famous. It was just yeah, just four masters of the craft. Yeah, doing, doing scenes from Absolutely. Shakespeare and just sonnets and plays and just Fantastic. Yeah, it was yeah just the way they held an audience was just yeah yes and he had that extraordinary technical power and skill and he played the camera so 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 beautifully and it, I remember him saying to me because I was nervous about having this romantic interaction with him when we when we came to the love scenes I remember him saying he gave me a little technical tip which was so fantastic at the time he said listen why don't you he suggested it he didn't tell me to do it he said you know drop your voice just drop it um and see what happens and of course it really worked you know because it just meant that it, the whole scene shifted into a different dynamic through me dropping the voice and making a different atmosphere so Made, making it a romantic or a sexy atmosphere, which is what we were trying to find at the time. Yeah, yeah well, he was it, a it, It's certainly very common amongst politics that that sort of relationship and age gap does happen. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not actually beyond what actually happens. But it, it, was, no, it, no, no. it, it, it was very interesting to play. It just, yeah, that whole relationship that the two of you had and the connections that you had were fascinating. Ooh. Um, yeah, and combine that with, with him with his wife too, in terms of the whole Lady Macbeth. Yes, yeah. so yeah. it was a fa- yeah fascinating work, um, which as I said is still yeah. still strong in my mind today, and um, I've shown my yeah. kids. And, what um, power, power, what power quality. does? It does yes, what power does? Which is which we're still watching, we're still enjoying, we're still exploring, I guess, dramatically. Now, Philip and I, as uh, Big Finish listeners, obviously we're Doctor Who fans. And as Doctor Who fans, we have often, all, all through the years, we've, we've, uh, we've had actors in our minds that we, that we like to think could have played the Doctor. Now, one of them for me was Jeremy Brett. And I remember you uh, in, an, in an episode of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, from way back then, do you have any memories of that? And and uh, what are your memories of Jeremy? No, uh, yeah, he was he was extraordinary. I do remember that. I remember him. I had to stand up in the carriage at at, an, at the end and have a tirade and have a shout. And uh, I do remember him. This is, I'm afraid, one of my only memories of him. There's that he didn't. He objected slightly to a woman of the era standing up in a carriage to shout that they never would. So I was rather pulled in different directions from a director who was saying, get up and, and really, you know, really give your performance. And and his measured idea of a, a much more measured Victorian woman. Uh, that's about, I do remember that. Other than that, he was fantastic and fantastic, obviously, to watch and that great voice. He was at Rada with my mum. So there you go. <laughs> so you've got a pretty... I mean, an amazing CV in terms of Pride and Pedras, um, Adam Bede. Um, so you've done some pretty amazing heavy works. Nice yeah. <laughs> yes, I've been blessed, haven't I? Yeah. You have. Now, one of the, now one, another one in terms of in Australia, once again, was big for us, was Ultraviolet, um, which was, you played Dr. Angela March for six episodes in there. That's sort of, I think that might yeah. be one of the first fantasy sort of things you did. Do you have many memories of working yeah. on that? Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, that's one of my 
personal real favorites, you know, um, I have a strong connection to that. Um, because a great, great friend of mine, Joe Ahern, wrote and directed it and conceived it. And I was doing a short film with him called The Carl. Brendan, Brendan Coyle was in there, uh, those three of us. And um, he was writing this piece and he discovered that my, I'm related to Joseph Harker, who was, who was taken by, um, sorry, distracted by my dog, um, uh, who knew Bram Stoker and, you know, because of Henry Irving, who Dracula was based on Henry Irving and Joseph Harker was Bram Stoker's, uh, Joseph Harker was Henry Irving's scenic painter. So he knew Bram Stoker very well. Bram Stoker borrowed his name to, for Jonathan Harker. And I think his, I believe his character as well, a little bit. So um, I had that connection. I was talking to Joe Hearn about it. And then he was telling me he was writing this, this uh, series called Ultraviolet. And uh, which was, which had these sort of vampires, you know, amongst us. And I thought it sounded fascinating. And then he started to develop the, um, Angie, oh. Angela Marsh around me, around me. So it was, so it was, you know, it was wonderful. And um, I felt very, very, very connected to that. Um, and yeah. It was extraordinary. I'd never done, I don't think anything like that. And I love working with Joe because he understands, um, he understands that thought is so important on screen. And, 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 and I love it that, you know, it can never be small enough for him in a dramatic moment. Um, and, and I respond very much to that, even though he's also, he also allows, you know, great operatic kind of, you know, huge emotions to play out. He's, he, he errs on the side of everything being under and under, which is where very much where my sensibility lies, you know. So I responded very much to him as a writer and a director for those reasons. Sorry about this. It's, it's an actress throwing a ball for a dog. <laughs> oh, well, whatever keeps you in the what? right, the spirit is fine. I'm not going to complain. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. d- now, in 2002, the, just going forward, you came to work with to Big Finish for the first time, um, which you yeah. may or may not remember, which was a production for, called Sharda. Oh, you do yes. remember it? So, because Paul McGann may be in a connection there too. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. what, what, how, did you come to, how did you come to get that role, come to work with Big Finish? What do you remember about? Oh, oh I remember Jason. Jason was lovely. Jason. Um... Hey, Gallery. Yes, of course. I nearly forgot your name there, Jason, but, um, but I didn't. Um, uh, but uh, I, I can't remember. I think it was Jason who, who contacted me. Someone did, <laughs> sent me the script, and, um, and, and I rocked up and did it, you know. Um, but in, 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 in Bristol, that was the first I experienced um, anything to do with Big Finish. But I do remember talking to Jason um, about Sapphire and Steel, and uh, how much I had been a fan and, and what sci-fi um, interest I had, you know, so I was a bit of a Trekkie and I had loved Doctor Who, you know, so he too, and I didn't know then at the time that I think he was obviously thinking about doing Sapphire and Steel. So that's how the Sapphire and Steel gig came, came along, um, which, was, which was great. You know, that was um, wonderful. So, so you said you were a fan of Sapphire and Steel prior to that? Well, yeah, I'd watched it as a kid in the in the seventies, eighties, wasn't it? Late seventies, I think it was. I'd yeah. watched it as a child. Yeah, early eighties. So, how, so how, did, um, how did you approach that? Um, uh, looking at Joanna Lumley's performance, because I think obviously Big Finish were trying to get Joanna first, and then um, um, they had to recast both parts because I think David McCallum too. They tried to get him as yeah. well. Um, yeah, how did you how did you approach that? I guess it, would it would, do you think it was easier being a fan of the show? You didn't have to do as much research. I just remembered the, the atmosphere and what it felt like, and I just responded to the material that was in front of me, you know, and gave it my best sort of cut, cut glass, you know, English voice, which I knew is what it was what was required. I remember meeting David and David being so completely charming and laid back. David Warner, obviously, um, and he, and having a real rapport with him, which was which was kind of essential, um, and um, 
that we both had that sense of having almost a sort of telepathic connection. Um, and that was established very early on with him. And, and, and that's really, that's really where, so I, I instinctively and intuitively responded to the material and also, um, you know, accessed uh, the, the, the natural kind of chemistry that I had with, with David, who was very supportive and present and, you know, couldn't have been more wonderful to work with. Yeah. So Nigel Fares was very involved with that production as well. Yeah, so he's a he's an actor too. So uh, what was he like yeah. to work with? Fantastic, of course. You know, and and that's the great thing about the whole Big Finish thing. I think there are a lot of actors who work there, um, and so you, you you have that sense of being in a little community of actors um, and people who are you know in, immersed in it, not just you know technical people. And were you disappointed when uh, it didn't continue? Because I think there were more stories in the works. But do you recall Big Finish uh, losing the license? I've had that conversation a few times and I can't remember what the reason was. There was some reason. It was a technical reason, wasn't it? I don't know. Yeah, just well, licensing. Yeah. Licensing or something. I think I was disappointed because I'd enjoyed it so much. But that's okay. You know, that's the life. Yeah. And we got three seasons out of it, so it was a, it was a really good run. Exactly. Mm. I met lots of wonderful people and had lots of nice biscuits and lunches. <laughs> Home-cooked lunches in the studio there, yeah. It was a time Sapphire never knew. I told her about their offer, but never how close I came to accepting it. The transients wanted us out of their way. They tried twice before. The first time they offered us a job, the second time they trapped us inside a time bubble. And the third time they used our emotional attachment to trap us here. <laughs> They're trapped forever. Trapped in a disc. Trapped in the fiction. Even if you did what you know, they wouldn't be able to distinguish you from the stories they're living through again and again. Do this after this. Do you seriously reckon any of them will be of any use in the war? When the transients launch their final offensive? Oh, Sapphire. You heard what happened to Silver? You had us all worried for a time there. Mm -hmm. Especially with Copper still missing. I'm surprised an old hand like you would fall for a simple trick like a movie <laughs> What is this? It's a shopping arcade, Steve. England? America. San Francisco. There's nobody here. Nobody shopping. It must be closed. I'm not going up there. Look. There. In the bookshop. A young man in his twenties just standing there. Who is he? I don't know. Please. Don't make me. I, I, I'm, I'm scared. Is he corporeal? No. A manifestation. Oh, so you're just going to sit here, are you? Sit here with a stupid book, getting drunk, wasting your life, wasting both our lives? You're paranoid, all of you. You're like terrified children. Just please, just this once, do something for me. No, for heaven's sake, what difference does it make if we go or not? Nothing's going to change. Justin, please. It's him. He's close. I can feel his breath on my cheek. Smell his clothes. But I can't see his face. I'm so sorry, my darling. in terms of the difficulty it is in terms of um, uh, women's roles and you're now starting to diversify um, how have you found the last I don't know 10 years in terms of an actor yeah it's much it's it isn't easy you know the work does fall away um, as you mature and it changes and um, but we're you know they're saying we're it's all part of the conversation now you know women are beginning to become more visible of an age so I'm at an advantage in some ways because um, myself and, and Marion Darbo are directing a film together. Um, and, and because we're of an age, you know, we're actually uh, being responded to, you know, and people are giving us that, that opportunity currently. Um, so, but, but I, and I'm interested in, in, in issues around that and the fact that, you know, it does fall away in writing work and developing ideas and work around, around that very 
to make it easier for for the next lot coming through you know i think it's we we we're, we're we're really at the sort of cutting edge of at the moment women of a particular age of how to change the climate you know for for women of an age in the future i hope you know so uh, that so it feels even though it's it's not a very nice place to be it's actually quite an interesting place to be because we are exploring you know what what how to make this better for women in the business um of a certain age you know and beyond and how to give us more supportive roles and and more roles that are not judge not judging us you know particularly on how we look and and to present women as they really are not either as very glamorous or very not glamorous you know but but as real people you know i think there is a movement so being involved in that is is exciting um and writing things to that theme as well you know yeah do, do, do you think shows now and, and plays and things are now kind of casting evenly male and female i mean traditionally yeah 50 50 always... is a thing it is mm. a thing well it is apparently 50 50 is a thing yes they say <laughs> no it's all beginning it's all beginning we have to see more evidence of it um yes yeah now, you, you did return to Big Finish one more time to do another Paul McGann story, Eye of Darkness, with by Matt Fitton, which was part of the Dark Eye series. Do you remember any memory of that whatsoever? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I, mean, I guess it must be weird that you just go in for a day. Because all this would just be going for a day. You may have had the script. I'm sure you would have had the script read. Remember that? Through. I really don't remember it. That's you, you were speaking on the extras on the end of the CD. I was listening to it today. And um, you were commenting yeah. on how great the lunches were. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they always are great. Famous <laughs> lunches. <laughs> so, so in yeah. terms of what, what, what are you coming up in the future? What, what, what's your hopes for the next 12 months or so? You've got a, you're dreading well, film. I'm developing, I'm doing a film with Mariam Darbo, you know, uh, and uh, so I'm directing... And I'm also writing and developing an idea, which I can't really talk about, unfortunately. It's awful to say those things, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's nice. So I've got nice things going on. Yeah. Are you an artist, Monsieur Doctor? Robocoat. What is your medium? Time. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who. Dark Eyes 4. I've lost something. I've reason to believe it's close by. I, I wonder... And this might sound odd, but have you seen a large blue box recently? There are hundreds of ships. Thousands. Alert High Command. They're heading straight for us. You fool! You're too late! <laughs> it's hard to explain, but let's just say there was a glitch in the chronology of the universe. Lost! You must have damaged the timelines more than I thought. The Doctor must be found! What's happening to your eyes? They're turning black. I am the destiny and salvation of the Dalek race. I will control all Dalek operations throughout all of time. Time controller? What do you control exactly? Stormic oh, Please, 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 please. No applause. I am just your humble master. Must. Stop. Time Lord. I was always coming back. I've just had to do it a little sooner than I'd have liked, that's all. It's Molly. It's something to do with Molly. Doctor! Now we talk. Big finish. We love stories. Exterminate! What an amazing conversation with Susanna. Thanks for organising that, Philip. No, it's an absolute pleasure. And what a joy for me that was, too. <laughs> I'll bet it was. I'll bet it was. All right. We we were talking about Sharda before uh, we started chatting with Susanna. And I should mention that the big Finnish version is an extended version. Uh, so it's a little bit different from the animated version online. Um, so that's what you get. It is still available from big Finnish, but I would like to give someone a sealed copy of Sharda today. See, it's still there in the plastic wrap. It's got a little bit of a crack on it, this copy, on the cover. So I apologise for that. But it is sealed. It has never been opened. And I will send it anywhere in the world. But what you need to do is, the first thing you need to do is subscribe to us on YouTube. So if you haven't done so already, uh, please do. Drop us a comment. Let us know what your favourite version of Sharda is and why. 
Uh, I'd love to know why as well. And uh, for a bonus entry into the draw, um, give us a review on Apple Podcasts as well. That would be fantastic. Five star reviews, uh, highly desired. <laughs> Is that the right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not so going to force you to a five star. If, yeah. if you would do. like a cop, if you would like a copy of what I consider to be the definitive version of Sharda, just uh, follow those instructions. If you've forgotten them, I'll drop them in the show notes or just rewind a little and hear them again. And uh, I will send that to you anywhere in the world. That's a How's bargain. That sound, Philip? What's well, good? I mean, we can afford to do that because our postage is reasonable, <laughs> unlike yeah. other places in the world whose postage <laughs> is totally unreasonable. That's it. All right, so I look forward to announcing that winner very shortly. But to finish off our episode, we've got uh, our regular recommendation section. And uh, whose turn is it, Phil? Uh, I think it's mine, actually, Dwayne. I think you're right. What would you like <laughs> to recommend for this uh, week? Well, uh, probably no surprise to anyone. The, uh, I'm going to recommend a TV show, uh, which is House of Cards, the BBC version. Don't worry about the American version, not that good. But the... British version of House of Cards is spectacular. Um, it, it, it's still, the ending still is just vivid in my head and had such a huge impact on me as a young man. Um, I just adored it. It's just wonderful. And for people in Australia, it's free to watch on iView, which is the ABC viewing service. I suspect if people search up in whatever country you're in, you can find a version easily enough. It's available on DVD. I know that the whole... There's three different shows of the trilogy. Susanna Harker, sadly, is only features the first section. Um, but it, all three series are brilliant, and the books are amazing to read as well. Um, can't recommend more highly. If you want an, an amazing cast, Ma, Miles Richardson? No. Ian Richardson. Ian. Uh, Ian. Miles, so, Miles is dead. <laughs> and, I, and if you listen to our interview on, with Miles, I did actually mention this show to Miles because his dad, Ian, made such a huge impression of me on me on this production, as did Susanna Harker. Um, House of Cards, BBC production. It's only four episodes, but they are about an hour and a half long, but spectacular. And just an interest, a fascinating insight into Parliament, English politics. And at this time, with how England's going, it's just as relevant as it was in 1990. Dwayne, what would you like to recommend? Well, I'm going to make it short and sweet because to uh, get up to speed with today's episode i thought i would have a listen to the final episode of dark eyes 4 which is the other doctor who story that susanna appears in the only other doctor who story uh, on the big finish catalog uh, which surprised me a little bit but i mean she i i didn't listen to sapphire and steel in she preparation did, she did to do three seasons of sapphire and steel so it's not like she's that's not right done much that's right so she was there a lot uh, with Big Finish there, but it's sadly unavailable. However, we've recently had the re-release of Stargate, so you never know. Sapphire and Steel may be uh, one of those ranges that can get a re-release at some point. I'm sure Big Finish would be looking into it because there are there would be a lot of people who uh, would uh, would be interested in that, particularly um, uh, since David Warner has done so much post Sapphire and Steel and has made such an impression on people. They'd want to go back and hear this work too. So I listened to Eye of Darkness, which is the final episode. There's 16 parts in this quadrilogy of box sets. So Eye of Darkness by Matt Fitton. And Susanna plays a, a pivotal role in that episode, shall we say. But what it made me realise is that it has been so long since I've heard these. I need to go back and listen to them again. I know you've listened to them more recently, Philip, but I haven't. And... I was just listening to this going, wow, this sounds fantastic. I have no idea what's going on, but I would really love to go back and listen to this and devour this from the start again. So even though Susanna appears only in the last episode, I'm going to recommend the entire four box sets of Dark Eyes. There you go. Yeah, it was a momentous set when it came out. It won lots of awards. I think Nicholas yeah. Briggs wrote the entire first box set, if I if remember correctly yes. off the top of my head. Yes, it was. And it is... It is a spectacular series. It took the Eighth Doctor in a whole new direction, and it was yeah that last episode. It's a it's a powerful one and wraps things up and gets us ready for the next bit. And once again, Livchenko isn't she wonderful? Yes. Anywho, it's a it's a great yeah great choice, Dwayne. 
Absolutely. So with that said, uh, thank you very much for listening, for watching. As I said, make sure you drop a comment, subscribe and give us a review and you'll be in the draw to win that uh, beautiful unopened uh, CD version of Sharda from Big Finish. I will send that to you anywhere in the world. And uh, keep in touch with us on our socials. We love to hear from you. Uh, until next time, see you, Philip. See you, Dwayne. G'day, Autofiles. <laughs> we'll catch you all next time. This has been The Sirens of Audio, episode 125, House of Sapphire, with our guests Susanna Harker and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Our website is sirensofaudio.com. You can email us at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or contact us via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.